Since 9-11, the United States has been led by its nose, by the Zionists, to enter into one war after another. To the extent that the Zionists, the Zionists have now taken the United States to a stage where it is militarily up to its throat in wars. And uh, to start new wars, particularly with Iran, could eventually lead the United States to a situation where it will face military defeat. And I think this is what the Zionists want. So that you have the monetary collapse, the economic collapse, the unpopularity of the United States all over the world, and now the impending military defeat. And only Israel will be able to intervene to save the United States. That's what Israel wants. And when Israel intervenes to save the United States from military defeat, the writing is on the wall. The United States is no longer the ruling state in the world. The curtain is coming down on Pax Americana. And so the attack on Iran, I believe, is meant to provoke a series of walls which will eventually trap the United States and bring about its decline as a ruling state in the world. You referred to Israel's control over governments around the world, which I think we will all accept. But the, the, this messianic drive, which you've referred to, it's, uh, seems it's causing destruction in the wars, but there's also theories, people talking about harp, earthquakes, forest fires. There's a general motivation for, for destruction. I guess this is to bring about the false messiah, as you put it. We will have to, uh, if it is possible, conduct sufficient research to be able to provide evidence that some of these so-called natural disasters are not so natural at all. <laughs> Uh, but sometimes a very convenient earthquake takes place, like the one which I anticipate would reach the Masjid in Jerusalem. It's called Masjid al-Aqsa, where the Temple of Solomon used to be located. When that convenient earthquake brings down that building, Israel can then move to reconstruct their temple. <laughs> and he cannot claim to be the Messiah, the false Messiah, the Antichrist, until he has rebuilt the temple. So, I think we need to be able to provide evidence, if it is possible to do so, to demonstrate that not all of these so-called natural disasters are natural at all. No, I'm so pleased you asked for that. Um, you know, it's giving religion a bad name if we're going through so much destruction and it's religious people in Zionism that are creating all this trouble and pain and we've seen millions of people die over the last 10 years and some people say, well, it's just religion. It's because of religion that these wars are happening. What would be your response? As a Muslim, I have tremendous respect for Judaism. And as a Muslim, I will not tolerate anyone vilifying the Jewish faith, disrespecting the Jewish faith. I cannot allow that because I have tremendous respect for Judaism. I have great respect for Christianity. The Zionists, however, don't seem to share that respect for Judaism. None at all. 
the Zionists, the Zionists appear to be people who have simply put on the clothing of Judaism. Whereas in effect they are an essentially godless people. They have no faith. They have no morals. They have no belief in judgment that they will have to answer one day for 9-11. They tell monstrous lies, Morris, monstrous lies. And yet, they don't care about it. They would kill innocent children, women. They would urinate on the dead body of an opponent. They would take the Quran and flush it down a toilet. And it doesn't bother them. They can still go home and have dinner and watch TV. As though the heart of a human being has been replaced with the heart of a beast. And so it is not really Judaism, the religion, which is being uh, tarnished by their conduct. And we in the world of Islam make a distinction between those Jews who are oppressors and those who are not. Those Jews who act in a manner contrary to Jewish religious beliefs and those Jews who remain faithful to the morals and ethics of Judaism. And we remain forever prepared to enter into friendship and into alliance with Christians and with Jews who share with us this abhorrence of Israel's manifest uh, oppressive behavior. I think we are living in a Jewish century and I would include consumerism and usury and the general lives we are all living so uh, it takes a stretch of the imagination to really imagine Judaism outside of usury and consumerism as the materialist world that we live in but uh, I, I guess there's a pure state where that exists per perhaps there are, Jews. there are Jews in the world who despise Israel <laughs> there are but but they're still perhaps happy to run the financial institutions of all the countries in the world um, I think there are Jews in the world who recognize the financial and monetary oppression that the banking system has now inflicted upon mankind and I, for one, would not want to stereotype all Jews and to put this blame at the, at the footstep of Judaism, the religion, but certainly Zionism. Zionism. And as I realized recently from one of the uh, prophecies of our prophet, uh, who said that we are going to make an alliance with something called room. The word room is in the Quran. And room in the Quran refers to Christians, but not Western Christians. It refers to Eastern Christians who have not been, uh, who have not become so much a part of modern Western civilization as Western Europe. It would be Russia the Orthodox Christian Church of Russia and of Eastern Europe. And he said that we are going to make an alliance with them. I see, Morris, I see the beginnings of that alliance already in uh, Iran's relationship with Russia. I see the beginnings of that alliance in the fact that Pakistan, Pakistan, is now moving away from its alliance with the United States and Pakistan is reaching out to Russia. 
I see the possibility that when NATO begins their big wars soon, that public opinion in Turkey is going to turn against the government, which at the moment is supporting NATO's membership, and that the Turkish people are going to wage civil war to take Turkey out of NATO. And in that civil war, the alliance with, the, with Russia is most likely going to manifest itself. And I think this will interest you, Maurice, because I notice that you have been paying a lot of attention to Syria. Um, I don't think that the present Syrian government has moral credentials and uh, religious credentials with which to be able to survive the sustained attack which has been lost on it by the Zionists. What the Syrian government has done over the last 40, 50 years is now, has now resulted in what is called the chickens coming home to roost. Hafiz al-Assad, for example, Bashar's father, was barbaric in his oppression of the majority Sunni population of Syria. The French are the ones who supported this minority Alawite group to take over Syria and rule Syria. And they've done so. And while they do have some support because of their uh, opposition to Israel and to Zionism, they do have some support in Syria. The fact is that chickens are coming home to roost now because a minority regime has sustained its, its, its oppression over a majority religious community, the Sunni. And so, my own personal opinion is that on its own, the Syrian regime cannot survive. And that neither Russia nor China would be able to intervene to save the Syrian regime. However, there is the possibility if it can be articulated in Syria to the Syrian majority Sunni community that the Prophet spoke of an alliance with Rome and so you should distance yourself from the Zionists and in your effort to liberate yourself from oppression and to bring back freedom to your country, you should align yourself with Russia. And if Russia understands the role that Russia can play, Russia can succeed in easing a transition in Syria, a bloodless transition, which would bring the majority community to rule over the country and yet maintain an alliance with Iran and yet maintain an alliance with Russia and so outmaneuver the Zionist plans over Syria. I don't see any other route open. I, I, and if, I, you do not, if you do not take an initiative it's only a matter of time before attrition results in the collapse of the Syrian regime. No, I think the, uh, my understanding is the ruling regime would probably agree with you wholeheartedly. They, they see themselves also as a bastion of Arab resistance and resistance against Zionism and um, pan-Arabism. But they would, uh, I think they will give way, as you have said, uh, under the cloak of elections, perhaps, but um, their main resistance is, is against Israel. I think they're prepared to see the light as you have described it. I'm there's surprised to reason. say. Excuse yeah. me? There's a second reason why 
the Syrian regime cannot survive. <laughs> it's not only because it's a religious minority, a sectarian minority, which has long oppressed the majority Sunni. But in addition to that, it is a, an essentially secular regime, secular and Arab nationalist. And neither secularism nor Arab nationalism can stand up at this particular moment in time to this Arab spring, <laughs> which, has been, which has been very cleverly planned to arouse the religious sentiments of the people and to bring about an Islamic awakening and Muslim, Islamic governments, so-called Islamic governments, all over the Arab world. And because Bashar al-Assad and his regime are secular and Arab nationalists, that also militates against their survival. Well, you've brought us on to the Arab Spring and the political parties which are Islamic and the Islamic movements. There's the, the terrible state of uh, Tripoli run by Bel Hajj, if I may say it is terrible. I mean, all these atrocities committed by people championing Islam. What, what has gone wrong? What is your interpretation? How has this happened? I think we have to make a distinction between Arab uprisings, spontaneous, so-called spontaneous Arab uprisings in Tunisia, in Egypt, etc., and a pre-planned and an armed insurrection in, uh, in Libya and now in Syria. This was planned long in advance. And there are many reasons why they wanted to bring down the Libyan government. One of which was, of course, Libya's opposition to Zionism and Libya's championing of the Palestinian cause. The other reason was, of course, and now we're learning about it more and more, of uh, Libya's plan to introduce a new currency, gold coins and silver coins, the dinar and dirham. Um, but there's a third reason, and that is that in order for Israel to rule the world, and for that man to stand up in Jerusalem and to declare that he is the Messiah, the the state of Israel must expand its territory because someone wrote into the Bible a falsehood. And that is that the Holy Land extends from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. That's not true, but that's there in the Bible. I think he did that because the Jews lived in, in Egypt for a few hundred years. And they lived in that part of Egypt that is known as the Eastern Delta, which is from the River Nile to the Red Sea. And so they decided that that is a part of the Holy Land. And the Jews lived in Babylon for a few hundred years. And so they decided that that also is a part of the Holy Land. And so in order for Israel to claim that it is holy Israel of David and of Solomon, the territory of the state of Israel will have to expand to encompass the biblical frontiers. And therefore, Israel has to take physical control of the Eastern Delta. And that requires an Israeli ground invasion of Egypt to take the Eastern Delta from the Nile to the Red Sea. I believe that part of the explanation for the attack on Libya lies in the fact that they wanted NATO 
to be in Libya so that when the attack on Egypt takes place Israel will launch a ground invasion from the east and NATO will attack from the west and I believe part of the strategy for the division of Sudan into two states and a southern Sudan which is increasingly linked with Israel is to allow for a further front from the south so that you deal with Sudan and Egypt at the same time and in the process you are able to take control of that part of Egypt which according to Israel is Israeli territory yes this is my this is my explanation for the long planned insurrection uh, in Libya dreadful and they've done the same with Syria and they would like to have had a no-fly zone they would have liked to have covered it in depleted uranium and toxic waste as they've done elsewhere but Russia has stopped that Russia and China I mean that is why I'm appear to defend the regime in in Damascus is out of fear of what the West would like to do but um, sir perhaps I can uh, bring you to the recent news that um, Iran is now going to sell its oil for gold to India that is confirmed and China may follow suit is is this the end of the dollar now oh the, uh, the dollar is already at its end it's, it's being kept alive artificially Morris and uh, it is because the US administration knows that an attack on Iran is going to bring down the dollar and that, that's why they don't want an attack on Iran they are also conscious of the fact that an attack on Iran is likely to lead to world war and the uh, United States much prefers to fight countries like Libya than a country like Russia <laughs> um, so I do believe that uh, we are seeing a positive development here that India and Russia and China and Turkey have already declared their intention to disregard and defy the sanctions on Iran uh, imposed by the Americans and by Europe but what we, we would like to do, Morris, is to try to bring about an alliance of like-minded people who are opposed to Zionism and to the Zionist quest for world political and economic dominion. If all of us who are like-minded can come together and that the world of Islam which stands at the forefront in resisting Zionism today were to take the lead, not the governments of course because the governments, most of them are in the pockets of the Zionists but the people that we can come together a good place to come together would be Venezuela <laughs> Mr. Chavez would be, well, would be pleased to welcome us in Venezuela and get to know each other and begin networking and uh, try to come up with a common policy and a common front one of which would be to restore real money which is gold and silver coins uh, for trade and to eliminate the use of the Zionist money I call it the Zionist money which has come out of Bretton Woods and the IMF the paper currencies yeah. yes well that's 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 a very good note to kind of end on it's a solution I was going to ask you what we can all do but in a way you've you've there uh, encompassed a vision and you've put Chavez at the top of it which is a, a a new idea I've not heard of this before but it makes sense where a resistance can be claimed it's a shame that Zionism has now adopted such a bad reputation and that it's been doing so much evil it didn't have to go that way but it has I, I guess these people have evolved from Eastern European Jews am I incorrect or uh, am I able to ask you that question that question I don't think the European is a bona fide Jew 
because a Jew is Semitic. Genetically, he's Semitic. Yes. And the Europeans are not a Semitic people. That's really, yes. And so, so I make a distinction between the European Jew and the Semitic Jew. But whoever chooses to claim to be a Jew ought to be recognized as a Jew. And so we recognize them as Jews. But Zionism was born out of a, an obsession of restoring the Jews in their Jewish homeland that God gave to them. And in restoring a state of Israel that David and Solomon had established. And although Zionism had never proclaimed it, in also causing that state of Israel to one day rule the world. Zionism from day one has employed deception. They began by saying all that we want to do is to provide a home for our people. But that was not true. What they wanted to do was to ultimately establish or re-establish Holy Israel and cause that Holy Israel to rule the world. And that will bring an end to history that would validate the Jewish claim to truth. They never said that, but now we know that. Zionism has employed every devious means and every wicked means to achieve that goal with monetary oppression, economic oppression, cultural oppression, agricultural oppression. And so there is no defense whatsoever, none at all, for Zionism. And we in the world who recognize that must now come together and form a common bond in opposition to Zionism. The world of Islam stands ready, the people, not the governments, the people, recognize that we have to build buildings with all those in the world who will join with us in a common bond to confront the Zionist oppression. I want to thank you very much. It's an occult, it's a cult of an uh, occultish thought that is ruling us, it seems. I, I want to thank you so much for your time and um, I would very much hope that we can do this again. You're most welcome, Morris. Yeah, I mean, if there's anything that you should add, please do. I, I, I think it's been a wealth of knowledge. I think perhaps the most urgent thing that we have mentioned today was a strategy that would resolve the problem in Syria. And that is that the majority Sunni Muslim community must be reminded that Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, prophesied that you will make an alliance with Rome, which is Russia and Eastern Europe, not the Western part, not the Zionist alliance, not NATO. And so the strategy for Syria, that the Syrian majority Muslim community, the Sunni Muslim community, must be reminded of what our prophet said, and that is that we Muslims will make an alliance with Rome, and Rome today is most certainly not NATO. Rather, Rome today is Russia and Eastern Europe. This, the Eastern Christians, not the Western. And therefore, the Sunni majority in Syria, in their legitimate struggle for liberation from the oppression of a regime, which has consistently oppressed them for the last 40, 50 years. Brutally oppressed them. Hafiz al-Assad, the father of Bashar, was notorious for his brutal oppression of the Sunni majority. And so they do have a legitimate struggle for liberation from oppression. But that struggle can achieve its objective in a peaceful way through Russian intervention. Once they reach out to Russia, then Russia would know that they have both sides on their side, the majority Sunni and the minority regime. 
And so Russia can act in a manner to mediate the struggle peacefully and bring about, if necessary, a regime change in Syria which will ensure that Syria does not enter into the Zionist camps, as Libya has done. I think that's the important thing. Uh, that's the most important thing to come out of this interview. Well, thank you. They are, they are having elections. We will see. They are having elections in February or March. I don't know. But I, 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 your, your message will, will get across, and many will listen and, and take it on board. And, and I, I wish thank to thank you for that. Thank you, Morris, yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you again. Bye. All right. Bye.